we're not going to go too much into this, but just like the Doppler effect that you probably saw a while ago, you know, like if a siren is coming at you, it sounds higher pitched. If it's moving away from you, it sounds lower pitched, right? That's that Doppler effect. It's because the waves are taking time to propagate and going away from you or towards you, relative motion. Now, if we take into account relativity, well, we're not going to go through this derivation, but the fact that the distance you measure between wave crests and the time that you measure it taking like a wave crest to hit you, those things are going to be different in these relative reference frames. The result of that is that we actually get these relationships for the wavelength of light you would see, you would observe if the source was, say, moving away from you, or in terms of the frequency, you could write it in terms of the frequency you would see, or frequency of light you would see. That's versus light moving towards you. These are the relationships you get for what wavelength you would observe versus what the source of the wavelength is. When the source is moving away from you, just like the Doppler effect, that wavelength is kind of stretching out and you end up redshifting the wave. Long, going towards the longer wavelength is, at least in the visible spectrum, is going towards the red. Versus when the source is moving towards you, that wavelength ends up getting squished and you get this blue shift. That again, in the visible spectrum, shorter wavelengths is shifting towards the blue or purple. Cool. So the formulation of thinking about space and time, space-time with these new postulates and how position, velocity, length, time intervals, how these things all transform depending on the reference frame that you're in and the relative speed of a reference frame you're observing. So the, the effect of these new changes in our understanding of relative motion is actually going to affect some of these very fundamental things that we use to understand the way that the universe works. For one, we've had this concept of momentum. Momentum is an incredibly fundamental concept in understanding the motion of massive objects and non-massive objects. Turning the motion of things in general, actually. But for the most part, we're thinking about massive objects here. So if we think back, what is the momentum? Well, it's in terms of the mass, the position, in fact, the change of position, and the that change of position happening over a period of time, or dx dt. So momentum incorporates all these really fundamental things, mass, position, time periods. But the reason that momentum looks like this, right? You could have written mass, position, and time periods in many different ways. This one, however, turns out to be conserved when you have collisions, if you were to transform between like Galilean transformations, right? This thing is incredibly useful because it's a conserved quantity. However, now that we have our Lorentz transformations, this thing is no longer going to be conserved when you do a Lorentz transformation. But we very much want to preserve this idea of momentum, so we need to come up with something that is, which would be our relativistic momentum. So when we're thinking now about relativity and this relative motion of reference frames, we have to go from, well, thinking about our classical momentum, just dx dt, and if you think about that, that momentum, that x and t, are assuming that we're measuring in the frame of the object. This is the displacement that the object experiences, and this is the time that object is experiencing that displacement in. What that means when we shift to thinking relatively or relativistically is that that time is tau. That's the proper time, actually, right? because that's the time in a frame that is stationary relative to the, the time that's being measured. If we want to then re-relate this measurement back to a reference frame that's, say, watching this object move by, right? so this is tau, the time this, this object is experiencing. If I watch something zoom by, right, its clock just ticked tau, but my clock that I'm measuring is ticking um, t, and t and tau are related, or dt and d tau are related by that proper time equation. So if you rewrite this differential of d d tau as d dt times dt over d tau, then using our proper time relation, it turns out that that dt d tau is just equal to gamma. So we end up getting that our relativistic momentum is actually gamma times sort of the classical momentum that you're talking about. And it's important to note that there's not 
an additional velocity that we're talking about, right? There's the object, and it is moving at a velocity u, and we're watching it moving. So that u is the relative velocity of these reference frames. That's why in this equation, it's not 1 minus b squared over c squared, it's 1 minus u squared over c squared. Because u just now is the relative velocity of these two reference frames. And thinking about continuity again, well, if u is much less than c, then that denominator goes to the square root of 1 minus 0, or just becoming 1, and we get back mass times the velocity, right? Our classical momentum. However, if u gets very large, right, if u goes towards becoming c, getting close to c, that denominator is actually going to 0, meaning that the relativistic momentum is blowing up. It's going towards infinity. So here we have just a graph of the relativistic momentum as a function of the speed of the object, u. It looks very similar to the gamma graph. This is asymptoting as the speed of the object approaches the speed of light. So what does this mean? Well, if you recall back to what it takes to change an object's momentum, if you want to change an object's momentum, you need to apply an impulse. Right? And an impulse is a force that's applied over a period of time. What this graph is showing is that as you get closer to the speed of light, as the velocity gets closer to the speed of light, as the momentum is increasing more and more, you essentially need to put more and more force, a larger and larger force, on that object in order to increase its momentum more. Or you need to be applying that same force for a longer and longer time. So basically, if you want to get an object, a massive object, to increase its momentum such that it moves at the speed of light now, you either need to apply an infinite amount of force, or you need to apply a force for an infinitely long period of time. Both of those things are not really physical, the result of which is that objects that are massive are always going to travel less than the speed of light. So now, last kind of things we want to talk about in terms of relativity have to do with energy. Right? Momentum is a very useful concept when you're trying to understand the motion of objects in the universe. Energy is also a very useful concept, particularly kinetic energy is one that is very useful. Kinetic energy is the energy due to objects in motion, right? massive objects in motion. We don't need to work through all the details of this, but essentially if we go back to the work energy theorem, it basically just says the change in an object's kinetic energy is going to be the work that's applied to that object. And right, that change in kinetic energy is the work, and in terms of the force being applied over a distance, integrate this force over a distance, right, that's essentially the work energy theorem. And we're just going to write the kinetic energy as K. Yeah, so we're not going to necessarily go through this, but if you just think about the force that's being applied, well, we can relate that to the change in momentum of the object, or the differential of this uh, momentum of the object, and just thinking about the x direction to somewhat simplify things. If we now transition to like a relativistic view, that momentum kind of picks up this gamma factor, and, well, it's just mu in the classical view, but now it's gamma m u with the velocity. This is sort of the transition to our relativistic picture. So the result of that is that our kinetic energy, which is now our relativistic kinetic energy, becomes this gamma minus 1 times the mass of the object times the speed of light squared. And there it is. Right? And then here's a graph of the relativistic kinetic energy. Similar to the relativistic momentum graph, it's basically governed by this Lorentz factor, gamma, such that the kinetic energy also goes towards infinity as the velocity of the object goes towards the speed of light. They're even comparing the classical kinetic energy you get if you were just calculate one half mv squared or mu squared. And then again, we want to consider that our continuity, we need to make sure that our relativistic stuff still makes sense if we try to go back towards our classical situations, right? Day-to-day -day situations, that being when the speed of the object is much less than the speed of light. So we're not going to go into too great a detail of this, 
But if you take the relativistic kinetic energy, well, that's the relativistic kinetic energy. So if you take gamma, you look at gamma just written with a negative one half exponent instead of one over the radical. And when u is much less than c, when the velocity is much less than the speed of light, the book shows that you can do this binomial expansion, or essentially a Taylor series expansion, and that gamma ends up being roughly equal to this one plus one half u squared over c squared. So if you put that gamma and then subtract one, right, because that's what's in the relativistic kinetic energy, subtract one, one half u squared over c squared. Now put that back in the relativistic kinetic energy, doo -doo 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 -doo, one half mass times the velocity of the object squared. So it's excellent continuity is just fine. We get back our classical kinetic energy. So let's do an example that kind of relates back to that graph of the relativistic kinetic energy versus the classical kinetic energy. So if we say I have an electron, the velocity of 0.99 c, or 99% of the speed of light, we want to calculate its kinetic energy in mega electron volts. And here's the um, relation between mega electron volts and joules. Calculate the relativistic kinetic energy, and then compare this to the classical value of the kinetic energy. All right, so its velocity, I guess we're using u. Velocity is 0.99 feet of light. Its mass, 9.1, might be in the problem statement of the book, but 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And this is a really weird thing, kind of an odd thing, but I always remember this value because someone at some point told me it's like an emergency on Halloween, right? 911 dial emergency on the 31st on Halloween. I don't know why that one stuck with me, but like I still remember it to this day, so I can pull out the mass of an electron in kilograms just like that. Anyway, let's see what is uh, the Lorentz factor for this electron. It's going to be that, and then 1 minus 0.99c. And again, since the velocity is in terms of c, that's going to cancel out just that 0.99 squared. This ends up being 7.088, keeping a few decimal places for the Lorentz factor. Right? And again, in this situation, there's no extra relative velocity of the reference frames because we're just talking about the stationary reference frame and then the reference frame of the electron, which is moving at this speed, u equal to 0.99c. So if that's the Lorentz factor, the relativistic kinetic energy looks like gamma minus 1 times mc squared. Well, all right, we'll write it out. Partially writing it out because we're out of space here, we're going to write that down here. The book actually has a typo in here. It shows m meters per second squared here, but the squared should be outside of those parentheses. Okay, this is being multiplied. They're all being multiplied here. Turns out that this is 4.992 times 10 to the minus 13th joules. We're given the conversion or the relation between mega electron volts and joules. So if you just multiply by one mega electron volt over 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13 joules, we're going to get that the relativistic kinetic energy in terms of MEVs or mega electron volts, 3.12. And you notice this is a, the reason that we use MEVs, mega electron volts, is just, as you notice, it's a much nicer number. You don't have all these powers of 10 floating around um, when we're working with the energy of particles like electrons and protons and things like that. And then in part B, well, what's the classical, or what would classical physics say that this kinetic energy is? One half m times the velocity squared. Put those numbers in, we end up getting 
4.018 times 10 to the minus 14th joules, or 0.251 MeV, mega electron volts, right? Significantly less than the relativistic energy, about 12 times less, actually. If we just jump back to this plot, that should hopefully make sense now that the relativistic kinetic energy is kind of exploding as you get towards the speed of light. But classical kinetic energy doesn't care. The speed of light is, doesn't mean anything to it. It only keeps getting bigger with the speed. Okay, a lot of whiteboard stuff in this one. Right? Because the final thing we want to look at is what's known as the total energy and the rest energy. So, go back to this relativistic kinetic energy and just distribute some of this out. If we rearrange this uh, equation, uh, sorry, false. then we have a few things related to each other. Right? This is the relativistic kinetic energy. This piece is something else adding to the relativistic kinetic energy to give us this total thing, which we are now going to identify as the total relativistic energy of an object. So this other thing then is energy, not from motion, and we're not talking about any sort of potential fields or potential energies either, right? None of that's been involved. So whatever is still here is the energy just from the object having mass, or it's the object that it would have even if it's at rest. So you sort of identify this with the rest energy, or the book, I think, actually technically writes it a little sub zero. But of course, the famous relation, one of the most famous equations there is, E is equal to mc squared. This is the energy that an object has just due to the fact that it is massive or it has mass. And there it is, right? And the fact that that rest energy has this factor of c squared means that even a tiny amount of mass is equivalent to a huge amount of energy. Just to put that uh, into context a little bit, get some numbers to that, you know, let's look at this example where we're talking about one gram of mass just sort of roughly the mass of like a small paper clip, or I think even a dollar bill, it's like a gram. So that's our uh, rest energy. It's one gram, but right, the SI unit, the standard unit is kilograms. So we wanna write this in terms of kilograms. but we're multiplying it by the speed of light squared. This ends up being nine times 10 to the 13th joules, right? Something like 90 trillion joules, which is a whole bunch of energy, hard to put into context, or maybe not that hard to put into context. So 90 trillion joules is a lot of energy, and I was thinking of a way to try to contextualize that I think, I may be off on this, but I did a rough calculation of the amount of joules, or essentially the amount of energy that a person would consume in their lifetime. I think if you consume about 2,500 calories, or kilocalories a day, and there's something like 26,000 days in an average person's life, turns out you consume something like two and a half times 10 to the 12th joules in your lifetime. This is about 35 times less than the energy in one gram of matter, one gram of mass. Or you could say that the energy just due to the mass of this paperclip is roughly equivalent to the energy that 35 people together consume in their lifetime. It's pretty wild. So why does that matter? Good question. Well, if you're able to tap into that energy, that energy due to mass, you essentially get a whole bunch of energy from a tiny amount, of, from a tiny thing. Very just little tiny chunks of mass can give you ridiculous amounts of energy. These are processes we would call nuclear processes, 
the sun goes through nuclear processes, it's powered by nuclear fusion. If the sun were just powered by, like if it was just a big fire pit, then that would be like a chemical reaction, and the sun would have burnt out a long, long time ago. Right? It puts out huge amounts of energy, and all that would have been consumed if it was just a, basically a flaming ball. It's not a flaming ball, it's a nuclear ball, which means that it can, while it's still putting out energy today, it's going to keep going for a few billion more years. We have found ways to tap into this nuclear energy in power plants. You have nuclear reactors, and you're able to produce large amounts of energy from very small quantities of fuel. These are some extreme examples, maybe, but there's also nuclear things happening all over the place. You know, you might know that your bananas have some amount of radioactive potassium, K40. So there's radioactive processes or nuclear processes happening in your average banana. But when you're talking about just a, a decay of, say, like one neutron into a proton, it's not a whole lot of energy on a grand scale, and so it doesn't really make, it's not very dangerous. So nuclear processes are actually relatively common, but most of them deal with very small amounts of matter, like single atomic nuclei, or the mass difference between a neutron and a proton, such that the energy involved there um, is not going to really harm us for the most part. It's pretty unlikely to do much damage, you know, keep eating bananas. So the very last thing then we're going to talk about, now that we have this total energy, trying to relate that back to our concept of momentum, relativistic momentum. Because overall, remember, momentum, energy, these are both very useful ways of looking at the motion of objects. And so we want to kind of preserve some kind of relation. We want to see how they're related now. Total energy and relativistic momentum. OK, so if we just take our total relativistic energy, and we're going to just square it, and see where we can go with that. M squared, M squared. It would be C to the fourth, right? But I'm going to write it as C squared and write another C squared multiplying that. So this is sort of where this trick comes in, where I'm going to throw in the speed of this object we're talking about, right? This, the speed of the object is already in this relation. It's in the Lorentz factor. It's just we're writing all that stuff together as gamma. Okay. But we're talking about an object in motion at a certain speed, u. So I'm going to put in u, but then I'm also going to subtract u. So that's just putting, essentially adding 0 to this parentheses in here, but writing 0 in this very odd way. And like I said, this is one of the main reasons I even wanted to show you this derivation at all, instead of just telling you what the outcome is is that it is remarkable how useful adding zero in a particular way can be. And I don't know if it's mathematics more generally, but probably. But certainly in physics, it turns out that if you add zero in a particular way, you can get remarkable results. Or multiplying by one, right? Multiply by one, the thing's still the same thing. But if you do it in a certain way, in a particular way, you can end up getting very interesting results from so you can think even of like, you know, if you have a fraction, I can rewrite the fraction by multiplying by 1, but say multiply by 1 written as 3 over 3, right? That's still 1, but it's a particular form of 1, and it changes the way I'm looking at it. So here, I'm adding 0, but I'm adding it in a really kind of an odd way, and we're going to get some useful results from that. So we're going to keep going with this. So u squared, and we're going to keep the minus u squared and c squared together. So just turn them around here and get that. Then this looks like, I can write this as, well, if I write the c squared out in front, then gamma, m, and u are all squared. And this is, in fact, that relativistic momentum. Then uh, in here, if I factor out that c squared, that's going to be 1. This is going to end up being u squared over c squared. 
So we're factoring out this other c squared. We left with 1 minus u squared over c squared. And if you notice, uh, this, well, remember that gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. This is actually 1 over gamma squared. So we have c squared with all its momentum squared, gamma squared, m squared, c now to the fourth over gamma squared. So now these gammas can go away. Remember, this was our total energy squared. So there you go. Now we're relating our total relativistic energy to our relativistic momentum, and it also brings along this rest energy. Right? Remember, mc squared was the rest energy. Yep, and that's it for relativity. I would just maybe point out or caution you that when doing this, it can be very confusing. One of the principal factors that confuse people is trying to keep straight your different frames of reference. So imagining yourself in different positions and watching things happen, this object flying by, or you're flying by and somebody else you're watching kind of go the opposite direction. So practicing with thinking about right frames of reference is going to be very useful. Okay. Call that good. I will see you next time.